it is really. We do have occasions in sessions like this, but this is also unique in its own way. It's a seminar round table with students and others participating. And it's possible to sign in that sense of the term. And we wanted to ensure, just taking a one of the leading law schools, law schools here, we wanted them to be exposed to some current thinking about international law. With three of our best representatives from different perspectives, who are capable of and we are likely to provide three different perspectives of what international law is able to do with respect to current challenges that face us. I deliberately use the I face us because challenges international is facing can be looked at from two basic perspectives as well as others. My colleagues and the panels and panelists can be put in and they have their own perspectives. I believe challenges are two kinds. First, systemic challenges. How does international develop, get created, promoted, develops, and then applies this one challenge in the process of qualification and progressive development of international law? And then there are many, many issues on that. Then, the other challenge is how is international solving the world's problems in terms of basic issues of making peace and security at the most basic level and at the international level? And then secondly, how far is it able to promote a universal justice and peace which is justice in terms of the basic mission of this institute? So when you look at this, Peace and justice, if you look at them too, I have already explained in my opening statement as president of the Institute on the first day that there are issues of minimum world public order and optimum public order. The, the international law faces challenges. But I will leave it to my colleagues to see how they would present the problem of current challenges and international level push back. And the first speaker. On my list is <coughs> we have first of all let me introduce our three women panelists who are sharing the dice with me today. One is I go from this side, but speakers will come to the side. First, Professor Michael Richman, a distinguished professor of Victorian Professor at Yale Law School has been both on doctrine as well as practice. He is a person with very unique and most fluent and most forceful presentation and, 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 and a point, he has been a teacher, a philosopher, a guide, and he is an advocate and a counsel and a large group both at national levels and international levels, both before the Institute of Public Justice and Publications and anywhere else. You can come there a better person with the longest, one of the best and most illustrious career uh, <coughs> both in practice and, and, and doctrine side. This is Professor Michael Wisdom. I have a good fortune of being a, at the end age of my own Yale doctorate time at Yale University during 60, 68 to 70. He was also one of my guides. So I'm very happy to have him with me and we have shared many, many moments together and I want you to have the opportunity to share some of them with you. Now the second panelist is an equally a cherished colleague of us. We are going together, Abdul Karama, Judge of the Internet Court of Justice for 18 years. Now in most leading international law practitioner and thinker from the African continent. We has we have gone together again since the days of law of conference, since 1978 onwards, 
right up to the end of it and thereafter. We will together and maritime boundary issues, most latest and current issues. And we just came out of a major conciliation commission in a matter that concerns Australia and East Timor, along with some of the countries we have here. Now, the third panelist, I couldn't introduce how so I do it. I cannot capture all her qualities. She has been a legal advisor, a scholar in her own right, legal brothers, people's republic of China. She has been to Colombia for a doctorate. She has been on the law commission. She has now been a judge of the International Court of Justice. And she, her contributions, both as a relations scholar, as a person who has done some extraordinary work in very complicated uh, bilateral legal issues, is one that inspires not only our colleagues and friends in China, but all over Asia. And she's a leading light from Asia. And I'm so happy. And she's chairman of the, the uh, Asian Society of International Law. And she and I both went together right from 91 onwards. We are hand in hand, shoulder to shoulder in many other institutions. So I can't have a better team to join me today to share their perspectives with you about the current challenges in international law. I give the floor first to Madam Shui Han Chin. We have a floor. Concerns the very development 
of the law, how to do it. So, but argument is, uh, one of the arguments is that we, we no longer have any proper subjects for codification by the LC. But personally, I feel deeper is really, the deeper reason is uh, that whether we really have the global consensus to take legal action on certain issues of general concern. So this is uh, 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 one observation. And sometimes uh, maybe a treaty is include, uh, it concluded, but with very few state parties. And recently we know uh, an important development in the area of uh, disarmament as the treaty on the prohibition of uh, nuclear weapons. And even though there are over 130 countries uh, join it, but uh, major countries, particularly nuclear states uh, and Western uh, states, stay away from it. So this is the phenomenon. And the second really is a treaty interpretation. Um, although for treaty interpretation, the guiding principles are laid down in Articles 32 and 33 of the Vienna Convention on all the treaties. Uh, but we notice, with the proliferation of international courts and the tribunals, a clearly uh, inconsistent jurisprudence on treaty interpretation. And uh, individual judgment even individual opinion of a certain uh, judge can override the plain and express term of a treaty provision. And uh, so uh, to what extent, we would ask the question, to what extent the court or tribunals have the power to exercise their uh, function in judicial interpretation and how far judicial interpretation can go. And we know that national courts in common law system and the civil system have very different practice in terms of judicial interpretation. And the, in international adjudication, individual judges may very much influenced by the legal system they come from. But that gave rise to the question as how we can uh, really not control but uh, uh, check judicial interpretation in the sense to make sure we have consistent jurisprudence in treaty interpretation, in, in interpretation of international law. Because the issue really concerns the question of sources of the law and its application. And otherwise, in this area, we will see a, a real fragmentation of the law. The third factor in this regard is formation and identification of custom international law. And the topic at the moment is the, on the agenda of LC. But we noticed the two criteria in identifying custom international law as announced, in, announced by the court, in, by the ICJ in the North uh, Sea Continental Shelf uh, case, the cases, uh, namely uh, Pinier Juris and uh, uh, general practice of states in line with uh, the opinion, are not consistently followed in practice and particularly in judicial practice. And of course, together with it, is the question of how to identify the general principles as recognized by civilized nations as provided by Article 38 of this LCD statute. So, in this regard, I think the current practice has to be reviewed, and this is really a uh, big challenge and being uh, discussed by international uh, and particularly with regard to 
practice of international arbitrations. This is the first challenge to the sources, to the development of the international law. The second challenge to the UN central law, in my opinion. Uh, today, international uh, international is increasing new players and proliferating platforms and forums and institutions. Uh, and uh, of course, there are various agendas for them. Uh, these uh, institutions, either regional or, or specialized for, uh, on the one hand, supplement the, uh, the, the UN functions in dealing with various global issues. On the other hand, they also uh, gave challenges to the necessary central role of the United Nations. And uh, in this regard, <clears throat> as far as international law is concerned, I think we face increasing danger or the risk of fragmentation of international law. And uh, it's very clear in lawmaking states really pick and choose form as they see fit. And for instance, in the field of uh, cyber crime, in dealing with the cyber crimes, of course, uh, uh, states do not agree that we should uh, use UN as the uh, platform. So this is the uh, my second observation. The third one is challenge from the developing countries, particularly the new economies, for democracy uh, uh, in the decision-making process of the existing international institutions. <clears throat> and uh, of course, uh, legally speak, institutionally, I and mean, legally speaking, this concerns the UN reforms and uh, general practice of international law. Uh, since I'm in India, I don't think I need no further explanation on this. And the last challenge, in my view, is the challenge to the global governance. And uh, of course, this point is related to the uh, previous point. Notwithstanding a general consensus that we need joint efforts to deal with the common issues such as the security threats, traditional and non-traditional, environmental uh, challenges, including climate change, great breaches of fundamental human rights, global economic and the trade issues. Uh, it's undeniable that nationalism, populism, and anti-globalization uh, moves are underwise. So these tendencies, in my view, do not come as a surprise, as the world is undergoing fundamental changes. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, the existing institutions could not cope with the current change. And, but as international lawyers, we may ask ourselves what we can do for global governance. What will really be the basis that we can you know, build on uh, this uh, global governance? And uh, at the moment, uh, I have to say, there is stakeholders oftentimes it seems to have uh, incoherent uh, and different agendas. So these four uh, challenges in my mind uh, are the major issues we have to keep in mind as international lawyers. So I will stop here and uh, uh, let other two colleagues give their views and then be waiting for your questions. Thank you very much. Many, many thanks for the clear and straightforward presentation on what Judge Shui has seen as some challenges to our current international law. Uh, instead, as a matter of administrative procedure, let me make it clear to you that we 
start a little late. Fortunately, we don't have any other engagement except going for dinner after this. So I'm taking the liberty, then, because so many of you are waiting for so long and now that this is your opportunity to hear, we will be here until 8 o'clock. So the discussion will take place for the next 15 20 minutes, things like this. Then I will make sure that all the students who have any questions, curious, innocent, complicated, otherwise troublesome, will take them. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you for your generous um, introduction. As you know, no one is happier than I. You can use for me. consideration that international law in whatever form it takes or whatever period it covers has always attempted to regulate the political and socio-economic affairs of state and for that reason alone it has always left itself open to challenges. Such challenges have been with respect to its universality, the universality of international law itself, its validity as to whether it's superior to other um, legal systems, its injustices, yes, international law, in my view, does contain some injustices, which that's why we are trying to um, rectify them, its injustices, its meanings, its unfairness, its lack um, of its lack in even handedness and uh, its lack of enforceability in certain cases. So the Institute as a body is devoted to the study and development of international law. It's well placed to determine if and to what extent the activities or actions of states are in uh, conformity with the principles and rules of international law and to call attention to this or to recognize this. As I stated a moment ago, international law has itself been synonymous with challenges. As 
we are aware of the history of the development of international law and various phases of globalization throughout history have been intertwined. International law emerged from the collapse of one form of globalization, namely the Holy Roman Empire. And globalization was inextricably linked with, the, with colonialism of the 19th century, an important period in which international law developed. Many of the institutes of international law, as you know, were developed during that period, the period of um, the 19th century. So as we are aware, with um, the Netherlands and Great Britain emerging as maritime nations in those days, they declined to recognize the paper rules, the Intercarter, or the Treaty of Thursdays of 1494, which the, through which the Pope had divided the world between the, the, the two maritime, maritime nations of those days. Gro, uh, Grotius declined in his Mare Liberum to recognize the, the then international legal order and defended his country's rights to navigate in the Indian Ocean and other eastern seas and to trade with neighboring territories over which Spain and Portugal had established a commercial monopoly as well as political dominion. Later, Great Britain took on the leading role in the struggle of the high sea, not only against Spain and Portugal, but also against Denmark in relation to the Baltic Sea. When European states later expanded and colonized different parts of the world, it came to be recognized and accepted that no state had exclusive dominion over the sea. The notion of the freedom of the high sea became common to all states and no state may purport to subject any part of it to its territorial sovereignty, which came to be recognized and codified in the 1958 Geneva Convention on the High Seas, and later enshrined in the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. So here we have evidence of the existing order being challenged at the time, and uh, the challenge resulted in the existing law. And then this was to the benefit of the whole of the international community. The <coughs> law of the ISIS was codified and progressively developed and is today part of customary international law. Under the Westphalia model of the nation state was uh, put in place, that is instead of paper Rules or paper and edits, the nation state was artificially constructed to which allegiance, loyalty, previously owed to the family, the village was transferred to the nation state with national flags and um, national anthems. The so called nation state implied close and national boundaries. It was on this foundation, the foundation of the nation state, on which the contemporary international law has been constructed and the, inter the existing international legal order is based. And let me make um, a declaration here. The reference of allegiance, loyalty to the families, to the village, it was later on transferred, constructed to the state came from Thomas Frank. He said many of the states, European states in Europe today are artificial. Although they are supposed to be nation state, but if you examine them closely, you come to realize they, they consist of several identities. But this, as I say, we now come to accept or to call what we talk, what we call the nation, nation state, as you know, you know as much as I do, for example, if you take Spain, there are so many nationalities there. And
and how they were able to transfer those agencies to a family, to a village, from a village, a village to a village, and transfer it to the state. And so Spain became what it is today. The allegiance today is to the state of Spain. So as I was saying a few moments ago, the UN Charter considered the constitution of the world, apart from its fundamental importance as a grand norm and a multilateral treaty, the Charter itself is based on the sovereignty and sovereign equality of states. The UN Charter, as we are all aware, embodies the fundamental principles of contemporary international law including the maintenance of international peace and security. And to this end, and it stipulates that international disputes that may lead to a breach of the peace shall be settled by peaceful means and in conformity with the principles of justice and international law. Article 2 for the Charter states that all member states shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state or in, order, or in any other manner inconsistent with the purposes of the United Nations. Article 2.4 is thus clear. Both the threat and use of force are prohibited in international law. The rule is a fundamental principle of the existing international legal order, which given the status of use projects, and has been recognized by the International Court of Justice as customary international law. So everyone is bound by it. However, when viewed against the background of the existing international situation, with respect to the ongoing situation in Afghanistan, Libya, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, or the occupation of foreign territories, all these pose a challenge to the existing international order. They would seem to be in violation of the rule prohibiting the use of force. In those cases that I have just mentioned, not only has the violation of international law been denied, but it is sometimes even used as a justification for the armed intervention in many of those conflicts. But, as the, but the Institute has a body dedicated to the study and the declaration of international law. It behoves it to call the attention of states and the international community as a whole that such violations are taking place and as well that international law needs to be upheld. And I say this not only in the context of challenges to the law, but in the light of the tremendous human suffering and cause to civilians in particular, when women and children have had to become the victims of such conflict. According to the United Nations report, Yemen has been described as the biggest humanitarian crisis. Yemen today is facing the worst cholera outbreak in the world. More than half a million people have been infected with cholera since the epidemic broke out in April this year. As the, country, as the country struggled to cope with 5,000 new cases a day, the report states that 1,975 1, people have now died from the acute diarrheal infection caused by ingestion of contaminated food or water. Last month, the World Health Organization estimated that around half of the cases and a quarter of the dead were children under 15. This huge amount of suffering by civilians has come about as a result of airstrikes and naval blockades said to have been sanctioned, said to have been sanctioned by a resolution of the Security Council of the United Nations. In other words, 
by outsourcing its authority by the Security Council or outsourcing its authority, its authority. It has allowed and forceful intervention in a civil war which does which has caused tremendous suffering among civilian population and which is not allowed by international law. International law does not allow for armed intervention in a civil war. In Syria, apart from the thousands of civilians that have been killed, more than five million of the population, yes, five million of the population have been internally displaced or sought sanctuary or asylum abroad. Lately, we are observing the almost genocidal pressure that is being brought from the Rohingya people in Myanmar. According to the United Nations Agency's report, the villages of the Rohingyas have been burned down. <coughs> Thousands have had to flee Myanmar, and the army appears to be trying to starve out the population from areas where the armed resistance is most active. The army has blockaded the United Nations agencies from delivering food, water, or medicine to the affected areas, leaving 250,000 people without regular access to food. This destructive narrative would be tragic and an outrage uh, to the conscience of the world, where we lacking in legal instruments prohibiting the use of force in international relations, prohibiting foreign intervention in civil wars, foreign armed intervention in civil wars, attacks against civilians in violation of humanitarian law and their human rights. But then we have the United Nations Charter prohibiting the threat or use of force. We have the Geneva Convention embodying the rules that um, apply in terms of armed conflict and that seek to protect civilians who are not or are no longer taking part in hostilities. We have the 1951 United Nations Convention on Refugees requesting parties to the Convention to provide refuge to those who are being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, and are unable to provide or to, to find um, protection within their own borders. And of course, there are also the two international and human rights conventions, the 1966 convention. So, talking about challenges, I think those are real challenges which are facing us, um, the international community, are facing international law today. And uh, the challenge is how to reconcile those conflicts, those violations with the rules of international law that presently exist. International law is not lacking in preventing armed intervention. It's not lacking to prevent humanitarian crises from um, affecting those who are not engaged in such conflict. International law is not lacking um, to protect the weak and those who, um, you know, who, as I said, are not taking part in armed conflict. But then we have the existing situation today, and we have the real challenges for international law. And I think um, the community of states um, and we as individuals in this room, in whatever way we can bring our governments and um, influence to bring on our government to ensure that um, such challenges are not, do not go unanswered. There are other challenges, of course, and um, challenges facing um, international law today and despite the charter and the newly adopted treaty by 122 countries at the United Nations in July on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, of the use of nuclear weapons. 
despite the existence of the non-proliferation treaty signed by 191 countries, <coughs> the world today may be watching in a nuclear catastrophe in slow motion. And I'm not exaggerating. I don't think I'm being high about it. We hear, we have to be here. We all witness this and nobody can foretell the consequences of such prediction. But we thought with the end of the Cold War, with the end of the uh, mad uh, mutual uh, uh, short destruction, that we put the issue of the use of nuclear weapons behind it. But once again, uh, the international law, in spite of the, its prohibition of the use of uh, nuclear weapons, has to watch, observe, and uh, what is uh, and, and, and what is playing out, and uh, which is giving us cause for concern. The issue of the so-called non-state actors, whose actions constitute a challenge, not only to the theory of international law, but also to the practice and the viability of existing states is also a challenge to international law. And it's only recently we started hearing about ISIS, ISIL, Al Qaeda, and of course, as I said, these non-state actors do not only pose a challenge to the theory of international law, but they also challenge the existence of states. On the one hand, there are the private military com companies, you know, like mercenaries who fight wars on different parts of the world. On the other hand, there are the actions of armed groups that use force against people and states. <coughs> the armed groups create a greater challenge, and there's no point character characterizing such groups as called terrorists, unquote. That does not aid in the understanding of the issue or how to deal with the problem. And don't get me wrong, I'm not condoning in any way the issue of uh, you know, these non-state actors. I'm just trying to say when you sloganize it, it doesn't provide an answer to the problem. That's all I'm trying to say. Please don't get it wrong that uh, if uh, so we have the issue of non-state actors, and there has been a response to that, which again challenges um, the whole issue of international law. You have read in the literature that because of the existence of such non-state actors, um, states are entitled, particularly if they are located within the territory of, an, of a state, and um, states are I say, entitled to use force against the non-state actor. But in my view, that would be in violation of Article 2, Paragraph 4 of the United Nations Charter, which stipulates that you cannot use force against the um, territorial integrity of another state. So although the target is the non-state actors, but then, that is, would be, a, a, as a minimum, an erosion, if not a violation, of the principles of international law and, of course, of the charter itself. So, um, since international law is um, predicated on the sovereign state, issues such as non-state actors, non-state actors, I think we have to engage with a new because the present, the existing international law does not provide for it, other than police action and uh, so on and so forth. Of course, if you can arrest those who have committed crimes against the state, crimes against the individuals, of course, they should be um, arrested and prosecuted. But to raise that to the level, to say, we can use bombers to bomb a state because this um, and non-state actors happen to find refuge in those states, I don't think would be in 
accordance with international law. So I think I've taken, taken up my 15 minutes, Mr. President. I will just sum up now. <laughs> Thus, as we have seen, international law has always been challenged for the reasons which I have uh, enunciated earlier. Again, as we have seen, some challenges do have a positive landing. I refer to the IC, which instead of it being monopolized, how it has been um, become an open seat and for the joint enjoyment of all states. Again, as we have seen, international law is facing serious challenges. While the institute, the institute or the institute is not the legislative body, the institute should <coughs> remain faithful to its original mission of reminding states of the roots of international law and the need to respect and comply with such rules and propose new rules when and where necessary. As we are doing it during this present session, with regard to the review of measures implementing decisions of the Security Council in the field of targeted sanction. As we are doing with an issue such as um, the impact or the effect of mass migration. So the message I would like to leave with the students, not with the others, not with those, is that you should not be fearful of challenges, provided the challenges and uh, make sure that they lead to positive uh, outcomes. And of course, also to ensure that we uphold the existing principles of this. Thank you. 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 International. It is also a psychologist. There are a lot of great professors who are working at the last school and others. I can refer to Dr. Machado, my dear friend Michael Bisman. Thank you very much, Dr. President Miguel. It's a pleasure to be here and to address one current challenge to international law, the title of this round table. I'll try to do it in a fashion that the New Haven School uses to address contemporary problems and to see to formulate or identify possible legal remedies. One issue in which new technology and political forces are challenging inherited legal arrangements is how the principle of non-intervention in internal affairs should be applied to the external influencing of the procedures and outcomes of elections in other states. Compared to more overt forms of intervention, this may seem to be de minimis, but it affects sovereignty and in the absence of clear law, is already generating interstate conflict. The genetic problem of implementing a policy of non-interference in the affairs of other states is that the so-called international arena in which international politics is supposed to be played is a metaphysical abstraction. No one here has ever seen the international arena. It doesn't exist. There is no such thing, only other states. And so to interact is to an extent to interfere. Indeed, much of international politics is actually about influencing decision making within other states. Alongside the diplomatic, military, and economic ways of influencing is what has been called the ideological or propaganda. And Kotilya's Arthashastra which the Vice President mentioned in our opening session, is probably the earliest treatment of this as an interstate strategy. While the diplomatic instrument involves direct communications by one government to another, 
ideological communications bypass the other state's government and are directed to popular audiences within the other state. And in contrast to the diplomatic mode, whose objective is to secure interstate agreements, the object of the ideologic strategy, far from agreements, but more like the military and economic instruments, is to compel the target government to change certain policies it is otherwise pursuing. This is accomplished by undermining or strengthening popular support for those policies, or simply weakening that other government. And the more democratic the state is, the more, more vulnerable it is to the external <coughs> ideological influence. And if the method is not physically coercive, its objective is. As long as the technology of mass communication was primitive and literacy was scarce, the use of the ideologic strategy was a marginal political issue and accordingly a minor legal problem. In the 15th century, Gutenberg's movable type opened up possibilities, but the transnational use of the ideological strategy was most profoundly affected by the French Revolution. Robespierre's program and doctrines were designed to export the revolution using the available technology. The early efforts to make scientific use of propaganda occurred in the First World War. The USSR continued to use the ideologic strategy as a major strategy in the interwar period. And attempts to regulate the use of propaganda were the subject of a few treaties and discussions in the League of Nations. The invention and diffusion of radio afforded opportunities which were brilliantly exploited by Jokins in the Second World War. But the internet, the World Wide Web, which is your environment, has opened fantastic possibilities for the use of the ideologic strategy. In a world of electronic simultaneity, the ideological instrument has come to be used by many governments as well as by myriad non-official actors. Methods range from overt direct exhortation to methods that conceal the identity of the actual agent, including the diffusion of apparently neutral news, the use of trolls, hacking, and the strategic and timely release of hacked material, and so forth. It has come to be used, among other things, to influence voting in other states both in the United States and in Europe. Indeed, democratic elections with their free-for-all marketplace of ideas have proved to be attractive and vulnerable targets for ideologic intervention. Even when they do not change an election's outcome, they can undermine confidence in the fairness of elections and thus erode the intangible yet vital legitimacy of the government. <coughs> While they are not as brutal as an explicit regime change, an indie comfortable in effect. Yet it would be a stretch to cabin such action under armed attack with its attendant implications. Although the United Nations Charter makes no express mention of the use of the ideologic instrument, it's been discussed in the United Nations and some draft conventions have been framed. <coughs> in parallel to the concept of perfidy in the law of armed conflict, some international legal policies would seem to prohibit, prohibit the peacetime interstate use of the ideologic instrument to affect elections. The Declaration on Friendly Relations affirms, for example, that, quote, every state has an inalienable right to choose its political, economic, social, and cultural systems without interference in any form by another state. That would certainly cover regime change, but it does not prohibit in terms efforts to influence by the use of ideological instruments the outcome of elections in other states. There are also policies that run counter to friendly relations. For example, Article 19 of the Universal Declaration states in relevant part that everyone has the right to receive and impart information and ideas through any medium and regardless of frontiers, 
Article 25 of the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights is to similar effect. Indeed, international law's installation of human rights has undermined the wall, therefore, protecting the internal affairs of states. So international law itself is pushing in this direction. Kofi Annan once observed that state sovereignty, in its most basic sense, is being redefined by the forces of globalization and internal cooperation. And he added, with admirable understatement, these parallel developments, remarkable and in many ways welcome, do not lend themselves to easy interpretations or simple conclusions. The developments to which Kofian referred act to legitimate direct action by one state or by its citizens that aim to influence internal arrangements and popular political choices in other states when this is done for the avowed purpose of advancing the international protection of human rights. NGOs, with or without the blessing and financing of governments, assist and even finance the whole or part local NGOs, while individuals from one state who are adept to the use of electoral political techniques exploit those skills often for financial gain in support of parties or factions in other states. These activities, conducted openly, may be viewed in the target states as less concerned with the integrity and enhancement of the local democratic and electoral processes, and actually concerned with favoring a particular group, usually when ranged against usually one <clears throat> ranged against the incumbent government. In other words, the target states may see the action as a violation of what they understand the non-intervention principle in friendly relations requires. <clears throat> as law students, you're well aware of the fact that it Inter inconsistent norms are not unknown, and in international law they certainly are not. Some scholars go so far as to say that the complementarity, the contradiction between different norms, functions to enable decision makers to fashion case by case a contextually appropriate outcome. But the resulting normative ambiguity can also lead to actions that exacerbate relations and generate conflict. To cite a current example, in the United States, Congress has imposed stiff economic sanctions against Russia for what American intelligence agencies have identified as Russian interference in the 2016 presidential elections. Crafting a relevant and practical international legal arrangement, the province of lawyers and what they can contribute to international law that lays down what should and may not be done, should allow for transnational promotion of democratic processes within states, but it should also protect the autonomy of free and fair elections and their outcomes. This raises difficult questions and they're not easy conclusions. Let me leave you with some of the questions. The most fundamental is whether international law should distinguish between outsiders whether they are state or non-state, who are intervening to support or enhance democratic processes on the one hand, and outsiders who are intervening to support a particular candidate on the other. Another question is, should the content of the cross-border ideological instrument affect the lawfulness of the action? Still another is, in order for a cross-border ideological communication to be lawful, other things being equal. Should the ultimate actor's identity be public, or may the actor use an alias or a cutout and impose the word of establishing and attribution on others? Still another is, does the variable of peace or war as between the states concerned affect the assessment of the lawfulness of the use of an ideological communication? And are the laws of armed conflicts distinction between permissible bruises and misinformation, cycle, or perfidious action 
relevance in our belligerent situation. And finally, should only information that's factually correct be used to influence electoral outcomes in another country or only false statements violate international law? The last question touches a sensible problem. Long ago, the United Nations Subcommission on Freedom of Information in the Press, the then Yugoslav member state, stated, I join the words information and propaganda. Today there is no neutral news and no neutral information. In the United States at the moment, the political system is wrestling with the epistemological neologism of alternate facts in what threatens to be a post-truth society. A century ago, Franz Kafka anticipated such a dystopia where he wrote, the lie becomes the organizing principle of reality. The assumption that civil, rational discourse with more information and more speech will ensure that the truth will prevail presupposes that there are some shared common truths affording community members the ability to differentiate between information and disinformation, propaganda and intelligence, lies and in the multicultural world in which international law and force operates, the absence of common truths will exacerbate an already difficult situation. And yet, for all the difficulties these questions pose, an effort to answer them now may not be put aside. In an important study in the current issue of the American Political Science Review, Hubeck and Marino, scholars at the University of London, conclude that I'm quoting, investing in the elections of others is not necessarily utility enhancing for the outside powers. In election wars against powers that do not value or even oppose democracy, the liberal hegemon's utility is generally below. In fact, both intervening states may be better off jointly committing not to intervene than expending resources against each other. <coughs> As thick as this is, ladies and gentlemen, it suggests that there may be space for agreement. Assuming that there is, international law provides a number of possible practical laws. A treaty concluded under the auspices of the UN and establishing a common inter inter policy, international policy, committing the state's parties to refrain from disinformation and election meddling, with perhaps a fact a standing fact finding commission to investigate allegations and attributions and establish a jurisprudence would certainly take time to agree. But in the interim, the Security Council Chapter 7 resolution could offer a short-term solution. Short of that, a gentleman's agreement between the relevant actors could clarify the normative regime and secure commitment to it. Though I can recall come from Eric Soy in an earlier session of the Institute of Expressing Doubts as to the availability of gender. <laughs>
your time. I just wanted to show how many of you really got it. But both of these very fundamentally cut over the analysis of some of the most troublesome problems the world is facing ideological instrument. Incidentally, Professor P. S. Murthy of Andhra University, who got his doctorate, JSP, at Yale, which went to the last one, and Krishna was available, of course, later, published, worked very hard on this question of ideological instrument, and he had one of the best books available. And you, the Indian students, must look for that book, read it, and read yourself for the content of news is the best source available from an Indian scholar of great eminence. So I recommend that book for your ideological institute of international law. Now, we have completed a round of initial presentations and uh, we are at the moment of 757 uh, uh, thing. We have good time. <coughs> As one who is coordinating this panel, I want to throw a few more things into the kitty so that you can also think about it on, other, on some other area also. <coughs> I'm an Indian. I came from this area. I went to A. I went all over the world. All these people who came all over the world, I worked with each one of them. Each one of them, I looked at them like this. Not only my memories goes how I got associated, what kind of problems we worked with. Them. But I ask myself, how come people like me are not that many now in India? How come I have a go to here, I find 150 international buyers sitting next to each other and still having a very busy time. How come in India, not even four international buyers are there and they have no time to each other? And they don't have a job. How come so many of us don't study international law for a career and and, 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 and ensure a long-term uh, uh, um, process like a fundamental science. You know, we have sciences. Now everybody is in technology, applied law, and making making sure it works something and make money out of it. How come we are so materialistic from a country like India, which has always prided itself in, in logic and philosophy and, and spirituality? How come we have more in investments and corporation law? How come we are so great in internet? How come we are so great in economics, banking, but not in international law? We have human rights lawyers, we have domestic lawyers, we have lawyers proliferating themselves in India. Thousands of them can't we find a hundred of them in India. Compared to China also, we don't have that many. Ask that question to yourself. One point to billion is not solved properly in terms of international law policy and promotion. And we, we don't have the kind of range and the ability to appreciate the process of international law, using it as an instrument to follow national policy like Europeans do, Americans do. Don't blame them. They are doing a good job on their people. And they are also incidentally trying to be incidentally helpful to us also. But that's incidental. It's not negative. So some of you at least try to look for a career. Not only will be serving the country, serving the world order, but also serving yourself. I'm not a, uh, all of us who took to international were never poor, right? We started poor, we were not poor. So don't worry, take to international law, make a career out of it, make, it will make good for yourself as a good uh, family owner, but also make good for the country. So that's first point I want to make. The second point I want to make is international challenges in terms of Poverty, human rights, environment, many other things are today not simply a matter of momentary or a matter of spatially confined things. These are global ones. We have to have a global vision. And India is from the right, from the days of its independence, has always been a part of a global process. We have identified some of the with the United Nations. We have identified ourselves with all global challenges from the beginning, in spite of our endemic poverty and lack of good governance. That basic perspective of linking ourselves with global systems, but contributing to it, but not, but not being at the receiving end of the 
process, but being part of the main process of contribution is what we need to look for. We have to change the dynamics. We are not the receptacles. We should not only be receptacles of others' wisdom, but we should contribute to that wisdom. That should be our motivation of the policy. Having said that, international is, Professor Michael Bishop used a very a peculiarly New Haven word, a normative ambiguity. It is full of it. Who is feeling this? Who is clarifying this at any particular moment? In any arbitration? Or any doctrine that we cite, quote, and each other? Not in Indian university based doctrines. These are based from Europe, in America. In other leading institutions are the ones who have contributed. So therefore, we are not participating in the process of clarifying the normative ambiguity which is consistently present. Every decision of the international tribunal is setting a new law altogether as an international investment price concern in which most of you are interested. No two, law, no two arbitrations are proposing the same type of issues that are commonality is not developing. That means that particular dispute is tailored to a particular situation and a particular policy. And you need to understand not only the spatial, the, the individual incidents into which the law develops in their totality. And we have to participate in it. We are not doing it. So I see many of these things as challenges from the point of international in sense, a 1.2 billion representation is awfully inadequate compared to the great inter contribution and inter ability that has been developed over centuries to in other parts of the world. We have learned from them, inspired by them, and they are guiding us also. They are not denying us the place, we are not taking it. So we have to come forward, imitate them in that sense of the term to be inspired and to contribute. That's the second point. The, the, and the world peace and justice issues are endemic. And these are def developed both at the national level through good governance and distribution and then of course equality and non-discrimination and providing equal opportunities for both gender equality and other equalities. But at the same time, the rich and poor nations, the, the kind of power politics that comes into play, ultimately being the arbiter of any particular issue for lack of proper justice and commonality of interest in terms of global order are big challenges. We have to understand that. And you cannot speak the language of power to answer the power. You have to speak the language of rule of law and justice to answer power. And therefore, law ultimately is the ultimate source through which world order has to be constructed. A power cannot be an answer to another power because then the balance of power system is what destroyed the earlier communities from becoming a universal community. And we don't want to go back that. Therefore, you need to develop a rule of law orientation, a universal rule of law orientation, a policy orientation in which not only you become very active to support and, and clearly define your own priorities, but integrate them into a global system where they become the fundamental uh, sources of inspiration, not only for our community, but for the entire world. And this is what our forefathers have taught us. That's Mahatma Gandhi, when he used non-violence, there was a Martin Luther King. There is a, a, a in South Africa, we have uh, another great leader came around with us. What kind of inspiration are we providing today from our side? Consider that. So with these thoughts, I will now open the discussion uh, from the younger students. Okay, since we are recording the session, I will pass the mic around. Please mention your name. When you flake your question, make it concise and also tell us who it is directed at. Right? So, so can you have some hands up so that I can identify you? There are some times there. Yeah. Thank you, sir. I'm uh, Professor Babson, teacher of international law here. Sir, I completely agree with you. India is doing wonders in IT and other areas when it comes to international law. Our contribution is nil. And I think the uh, last two years of our efforts, bringing the galaxy of uh, international law as here is a starting point, I think, sir. Thanks to you and uh, thanks to all the delegates. We, we can see that this is a beginning for uh, in the preparation of English lives from Indian sites. So thank you.
Uh, Ma'am, sirs, I'd just like to state that uh, it's an honor to be able to address you with something that I don't think any of us thought we'd be able to do in our, uh, in our wildest dreams. But um, anyway, so my name is Vishesh Bhatia and I'm in the third year. And my question relates to what I believe is the cardinal principle of international law, which is the non-use of force. I believe that in the 21st century, the principle of what constitutes a use of force has become increasingly big. So for example, um, where a cyber attack uh, which, is an, uh, which is an action that is intangible, can have very tangible consequences, can result in the deaths of hundreds of people very directly, where um, a trade embargo can initiate a famine in another country and again very directly cause the deaths of hundreds of people. We have failed to define a metric or a threshold for what would constitute a use of force. And my question therefore is, um, is this not a great impediment to the application of uh, international law? As the use of force, as peace and security is the very objective of um, international law, and the use of and, and peace and security is predicated on the non-use of force. So, yeah. so, so, should we, this so should we collect questions or should we go one by one? Yeah, no, no, we'll take a few questions. We'll collect a few questions. It is the, directed to uh, Judge Kuroma. Okay. Who will come? Next. Next. So we will collect a few questions. Right. We'll collect a few questions. Yeah, collect a few questions. Thank you. Now I'm going to directly to you, ma'am. Okay, as you said, there's a big challenge which is posed. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. I'm Chandra Kumar from first year. You say there's a big challenge posed by the developing countries in the international forum. Uh, don't you think, in like back in 1970s, when there was a policy by developing countries, there was a new international economic order which would give them a sort of economic freedom? So don't you think that economic freedom would have been enough for them from that level? For them to call it, attain certain freedom which would have led to you know reduce, reducing the problems which are present right now. The question is for clarify. Yeah. Yes. Clarify. The question is to you. <coughs> 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 uh, hi, my name is Balaji, I'm in the fifth year. Uh, I have a question to the panel as a whole. Uh, essentially my question is I, I I'd really like to hear your thoughts on the nature of treaty making itself, the nature of treaty negotiation, um, especially in light of these new free trade agreements, for example, the TPP, the RCEP, and so on, which are negotiated in secret. So, in terms of treaty formation, is the negotiation of treaties in secret a new development? If so, is it desirable? And second, what is your opinion on the leaks of negotiation texts. So for example, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement was available to the entire world through the leaks. Right? Do you see this as a progressive development or do you see this as a threat to negotiations as such? And that's for the entire world? Yes. Uh, the entire world. Uh, so specify to them. So please specify to whom you are asking your question. Right? And please speak slowly and deliberately so that everybody follows. Hi, so my name is Priyambada Shivaji and I'm from the third year. So uh, this is a question once again directed to the entire panel. So I'd just like to know your personal opinions on whether consent should still continue to be the sole basis of in international law and um, whether you would, for instance, continue to place importance on cultural relativism in these times where, for instance, as you pointed out, cross-border terrorism is becoming a big deal and interference is happening in new subtle ways as well. The entire panel. I think it's like a multiple. I think questions that the entire panel is not good strategy, but uh, <laughs> we go to the back. Yeah, um, hello, this is Yash Tarnakaran from the third year. So I think my question will be directed to Madam Judge and to um, Judge Koroma. So, um, do you think it's time to move away from having the Security Council to enforce decisions? Seeing that in a case where Judge Kaluma was there, where you presided over, where Awema, where the, pa the party in question decided not to enforce it, and maybe to ma'am also because ma'am is sitting in the current case where a very similar question is raised of um, human rights in foreign courts. So, do you think we should move away from the SC as a body to enforce decisions? That's all. Thank you. Should we take a few more or should we? We have a round of responses. Okay. Yeah. I think uh, I'm trying to understand your question. I think the first question I just about the international economic 
you can have water in the seventh, right? Yes. yes. Yeah. And uh, your question is why your water was not established, right? And uh, what we are facing today. Yeah. Is that your question? Yeah, my question was, had it been established at that time itself, there wouldn't have been any problems as of now. So why wasn't it established at that time, right back in the 1970s? For lack of it, we are still having industries going. We have been established in part things were improved as far as the business issues are concerned. I'm trying to uh, uh, clarify your question. Okay, I'll try to clarify it. Why wasn't it established at that time? What went wrong? Why did we get to international? Yeah, that's what I understand what you're trying to say. When I say that the challenge is from the developing countries, particularly the new economies, for uh, more democracy in international affairs. Of course, right away, we you recall the efforts in the 1970s, when the developing countries call for the established new international economic order. You may recall that movement came around after the, uh, the, the big change with the, uh, uh, the oil crisis. And that gave the developing countries, particularly uh, with the oil uh, production uh, producers, countries see their strengths. But you have to recognize at that time, uh, despite this uh, UN forum where developing countries can you know, express their real will, but they, are not, they were not in a position to push forward. But what, why today the world has to see the development of the new economies particularly those in Asia with China, India, ASEAN countries, and, uh, and then BRICS. Uh, now they're, they are different. And uh, for instance, the BRICS summit just finished. I, I read from the news. And the, the, the BRICS countries, the total output is now already surpassed the total output of the G7. This is unimaginable in the past, and it's unprecedented so far. And China as a developing country, for the first time in history, a developing country become the second largest economy in the world, and, and the Indian develops very fast. And so this is the question I think just Dr. Roth, uh, Dr. Roth is now uh, raised to you. You have to ask yourself, why 1.3 billion Indian? Why 1.4 billion Chinese? You can hardly find any, you know, uh, so, you know, prominent international lawyers actively playing their role on the world stage. But I have to correct uh, Dr. Rao one thing. Indian has indeed produced very many prominent international law scholars. I can mention like Professor, Professor Anand and Professor Mani who has just passed away. They made great contributions to the development of international law. And currently, Professor uh, Man, uh, uh, Chimney for the understanding of international law. But as countries in the real life in the developing international, why developing countries' voice is so low and not, a, not being heard? This is the essence of the law, the essence of the ecosystem. And not because of the history that international law was based on European practice, the European system, also because the currently, and in world affairs, they do not have that deciding role to play because they're they are not powerful enough. And with the new economy, uh, the development of the new economies, uh, the, the countries call for democracy uh, in, in the uh, decision-making of international affairs. That, that's the very reason for it. Uh, the second question, should I address? Or should I get uh, the <laughs> I'm <laughs> 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 
Thank you very much for the relevant questions. Um, as lawyers, we operate under rules, and without rules, we will have chaos and anarchy. Yes, um, cyber is uh, cyber warfare at the moment, but that does not negate the prohibition against the uh, of prohibition of the use of force. As we pointed out earlier, as you know, uh, international law is constructed on the nation-state system. And it doesn't necessarily fall because, because you have a new form of warfare. It invalidates the existing rule. The violation of the rule does not imagine you negate the rule. The rule has, has, um, still has a place to play. And don't forget that when it comes to the application of the rule, if you say there has been a cyber attack, then of course the appropriate forum to address such an attack is through the Security Council. So that does not make the rule irrelevant. As you know, um, when the charter was being constructed or being elaborated, various forms of the use of force were proposed, but um, the United Nations or whatever, the originators of the charter decided on armed force. So it is not um, impossible that um, the charter is still sufficiently broad to accommodate other forms of force. I would like you to be discouraged to think that um, now people can find or other ways of violating the charter without any recourse. Now, the other point I would like um, to highlight to you, well, I think one of the questions has raised the issue of um, cultural relativity. Uh, and international law is supposed to be universal. It is not supposed to represent one sphere of the globe, and for its essential validity, it has to be here. I think that to, we have to have, all of us have to have the stake in it. Otherwise, um, it's not universal, it's not international. So, and uh, without making a note, as you know, articles have been written on this issue of multiculturalism and international law, and uh, how developing countries, or these days we call them the South, have contributed meaningfully to the development of international. I think that should be important. You can look at the literature. You know, that has been written, including your um, scholar. Thank you. Uh, can I uh, where's Give the floor to Michael also to respond to some of his questions. No, I'm not going to respond to questions that have been assigned to my colleagues. I'm delighted to see all the seven points that are here. I do, want, I do want to comment on my friend Judge Corona's recent statement in response to the very pertinent question of what do you do when there are innovative uses of force in the world community. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't mean to discourage you, but the answer is not just to go to the Security Council. Supposing the cyber intervention is coming from a permanent member of the Security Council. One of the great repositories of cyber warfare. The the United Nations Charter and the principles that it establishes are very important. But unfortunately, there is not a congruence between the aspirations that are captured in the Charter and the actual effective power that is available to implement in every case. Sometimes things work out. The targeted sanctions against people financing some of the terror, the international terror, which the Institute has been discussing, is a good example of when the Security Council operated exactly as it was supposed to. That's very rare. Which raises the question of, first, should international law adjust the threshold of response in the absence of an effective remedy coming from the Security Council? 
And that's a very difficult question. There's no, no doubt that you can identify harms, very serious destruction deriving from, as you would say, from cyber warfare, which is secret, silent, and deadly, but very effective and can destroy the infrastructure of the state. And economic sanctions, which can have the can destroy the single commodity the state, for example, the US collapse of Cuba's secure of Cuba's sugar quota. If you look at the charter, the charter says that you have the right to respond to an armed attack as an exercise of your right of self-defense. The threshold has been armed attack. And if you think about lowering that threshold to take account of innovative methods, just appreciate that you're going to have an increase of unilateral violence. And that may set off a spiral of greater and greater violence. So from the standpoint of the changing international law to address these new issues by lowering the threshold, very, very complicated and one would proceed with great caution. We already see that there is, and I'm not sure this is a good development, there is a tendency for certain unilateral actions to be endorsed as lawful, or at least not as illegal, even though they have not received the prior agreement of the Security Council. Take a very recent <coughs> example. Uh, the United States bombed uh, some factories in Syria when chemical weapons were used by, allegedly used by the Syrian government. The Syrian government denied it. That was unilateral. There was no effort to get permission from the Security Council. But it seemed to be endorsed. And one of the troubling aspects of it was that it also served the short-term interests of the politician that made his decision to use it demonstrating that he was macho and decisive and so on. So we find that there's a rather fluid pattern of endorsing some unilateral uses, indicating that there may be an unarticulated code of some unilateral actions being lawful. Sorry for that long. Okay. That's precisely what we need to know. Because first of all, the Security Council is mostly non-functional because of veto. Everybody knows it. But you have to program that into see how the world market can be promoted through that UN and Security Council system on the basis of charter. Charter itself, certain provisions are no longer operable because of this Security Council not functioning properly. And that he pointed out. I, I would call for some restraint in denouncing the Security Council. We know it's not a perfect organ, but I listen to my friend Professor Riesman carefully. He said, if you suffer a cyber attack and go to the Security Council, I was waiting for him to land the blow. So what do you do? I know there is NATO, because NATO, they have um, a mechanism in place, an attack against the cyber attack against one NATO member is a, an attack against the other. But what does Simon do if, you, if we suffer an, an, an attack, I mean, a cyber attack? What do I do? I only have to go to the Security Council. And it's in that sense, I would say. I, I know the Security Council is not a perfect body, but what says to you? Where do I complain? I'm not a member of it. In, in any case, I'll try to point out a few. See, what we are trying to project to is not answers. We're trying to project to a system of way of thinking about some of these problems. Because there's an enormous literature for As I told you, if I say, look at any one of them, they have all worked on this matter. So we, it's not like some people are not working at it. One of the problems of international law as, as community of international law here from the institute members and others is to look for a role for law in a situation where power and other disintegrated world is not allowed to a role. So that is one of the ways in which we creatively interacting, getting interposed into these situations. For example, in the case of this uh, Qatar um, uh, situation where I'm a little bit privy, uh, uh, being there for some time, uh, the question is one of finding evidence, one of presenting a proper evidence which is not only relevant for 
a court of law in case of a prosecution has to take place, but a credible evidence to start with to get a public opinion on its side. And then we know what is happening in the case of the election in the United States and we papers are full of uh, the information concerning so-called sources from Russia. But Russia keeps denying it and it's one sentence they will deny the whole thing and say, look, it's you for you to prove it. And it's all propaganda. So they dismiss it with the two words, the whole thing. And then they will also look like, oh, somebody did it from the Maybe they are not in the they not in the Oh, they are back in the thing. Maybe they are everywhere. In your country are there, in my country are there, what do you want to do? So that kind of a, a very easy way of getting them, so evidence is the question. Terrorism, financing terrorism, same issue. You have to look at the particular person and a group that has actually indicted in this thing on the basis of money source from X, Y, Z. Then the X, Y, Z plus the one who use it and brought to them for evidence. And that's where rule of law, that's where transparency, that's where all kinds of error. It could be everybody accused as innocence. These principles are operate. This, but in spite of these difficulties, my friends and colleagues with whom I have grown up have very creatively advising, creatively guiding through their contributions on countermeasures, on unilateral measures, on humanitarian intervention, on um, uh, these are all the methodologies by which the lack of consensus at the UN and the Security Council are being addressed by way of enforcing what is right. And what Karoma is saying is, which Karoma is saying is a fundamental point. What he's saying is, accepting the deficiencies, accepting the current world orders, inability to promote a universal world order of sharing common values of all communities and their interests, which is not there, and we are still always constantly evolving, it's like a crucible where we are interacting and trying to develop it. How do we save the existing institutions and how do we not make them more ineffective and less credible than what they already are? Because if you throw them, you have to create the whole thing. You have to go back again to San Francisco. Maybe we'll go to some Beijing now this time to go back and do the United Nations. Because they have the money in there. <laughs> so we all have the private factors. But the, 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 the one who has the money is the calling the charts, you see. So if you lose the San Francisco charter, I will get a Beijing charter later. So you, some charter has to come because there's nothing there. So we need to create some. So therefore, existing institutions, in spite of their inabilities and ineffectiveness, we have to respect them, we have to promote them. I think we are talking about the United Nations. What's happening in India? Which institution is working? But yet, democracy and all just in the So we have to pride ourselves with what we've got. We have to preserve what is left of it promote it to a direction in which we can go. And there are always there's some kind of an interposing uh, in, uh, in transitory measures which we have to apply to make sure that some minimum order is maintained and later we go for better things. This happens in individual cases. Each individual also has a choice as a table stage, states have a choice as a table stage, but there must be goal, there must be policy, there must be an orientation between when the choice has to be made, make it for more common good more common, common value, that kind of, that is the answer ultimately. And anyway, I don't want that. Well, Dr. Rao, this one to mention here. I will also add to that. Sorry, sorry. The, the yeah, cyber one. issue, actually, is a very good example, as I said, the challenge to the UN central role in world affairs, and the challenge to the global govern governance, as we all call for. Uh, this is a typical example. With the Security Council, I have to say, Today, Security Council, if you talk about relations among Security Council members, particularly the key files, relations are much more complicated than the Cold War Europe. And some issues, they work pretty well, and others, they may have, still have major differences. And the ideological element always comes into play, and the Cold War syndrome persisting to exist. So all these things mix together. And in today's world, we see technology development with uh, uh, non-state actors with complicated situations like uh, terrorism, like uh, climate change, you know, like uncoupling. Um, all these things are very difficult to simply apply traditional rules. 
or institutions. So you need concerted efforts of all parties. And uh, oftentimes we see, uh, you know, individual cases, very, very, very complicated, for instance, in North Korea, uh, nuclear weapons and the current US-Russian relations. But at the end of the day, we find today's world indeed is different. And the interdependence is not uh, simply an academic word. It's a practical matter. The big countries have to talk to each other, have to cooperate on many issues. And uh, so um, I feel that uh, this is the challenge to international. And uh, I remember the question whether uh, the national courts should review the Security Council decision. And uh, we just had a long day dealing with a uh, very complicated issue uh, bearing on that. Uh, of course, we uphold human rights protection. And the Security Council should be accountable for its action and should act in line with the human rights protection, uh, human rights uh, uh, principles. But when we say Security Council decisions are subject to national regional courts, as I said, the problem even with international judication, uh, uh, judicial interpretation can really present a lot of problems. And you don't have, when you lose the constitutional framework, framework just giving the individual judges to interpret uh, as they sit the deem correct, you may uh, really uh, have very unexpected results. And at a national level, the things can even go wrong in the sense different interpretations could come out. And at the end of the day, what would the suffer? is the, security, the collective security system, the UN system that will suffer. And, and this is something I think we have to keep in mind, because this is the very challenge that we will face. The, the world is undergoing tremendous changes. Thank you. I would like to give the floor, but unfortunately, this is such a engaging topic we want. One of my colleagues, one of the brilliant international lawyer, Alan Pelle, is with us, and he wanted to take it over a few minutes, and I would like to take it over. Not, not a few minutes, two minutes. Uh, in, a very, in a very few words, I would like to, to say, uh, to address a very general issue, which I think was uh, behind the, the heads of the speakers, uh, and I, want, I would like to mitigate what has been said, in particular maybe by my good friend, Judge Hue. Uh, right is right, no. No, in that uh, law mitigates the brutality, I think, of the uh, game of powers. Nevertheless, I think that uh, uh, law reflects, or legal rule reflects a balance of, uh, of power and in this respect, I must say, I'm very uncomfortable with the expression used several times by uh, Judge Shui uh, when she spoke of international democracy. Uh, democracy does not mean one state, one vote. Democracy means one a human being, one vote. Uh, and uh, uh, this said, I, I do agree that uh, there is a trend toward a new uh, balance of power between states uh, in the international uh, society, which uh, unavoidably will have uh, and already has influence on uh, on positive international uh, for better or for worse. But I really uh, challenge uh, the very expression international democracy. Balance uh, of sovereignty has nothing to do with democracy. Uh, I think we have time for one more round. I think we need more students. Okay. Yeah, well, I started them because they had their hands up first. Okay. <laughs> Hello. So, as a map, this is Madre Dixit from the Thorio. I actually have two questions. 
The first one goes to Josh Karoma and Professor Riesman. My question was regarding how we always um, pose sovereignty at the center of the question of international law. How is that compatible with one country trying to interfere, so to speak, in the other country to help the, uh, to help the human rights situation in the other country? We came up with this uh, idea of right to protect, but we also see it as a very politically volatile concept where it can be used only against some countries selectively. So my second question is to Professor Leesman with regards to uh, cyber attacks and um, the legality of it all. Since we see that all concepts of armed attack uh, are fairly inflexible and even concepts of non-intervention are interpreted very conventionally, should we go towards a uh, soft law to regulate this question? When I talk about code of, like, for example, the UN body talking about cyber attacks, should we look at a code of conduct to be adopted instead of like a central law? Take a few more questions quickly. I have one question on uh, comments, uh, so that uh, more people can ask the question. Uh, go, go for it. Then I will give the time final chance to uh, yeah, No problem. Go ahead. Go ahead. Please. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Sarla. I am a third year law student. And my question is also directed to Mr. Mason. Um, so, one of the defining things for me is that we see sort of a, a shift towards a more ethno-nationalist, more populist um, kind of ideology uh, globally. Um, and a lot of that is taking a huge share of elections, and in fact winning quite a lot of elections. As Mr. Reesman said, also talked about propaganda and alternate facts, etc. Um, so my question is, in your opinion, do you think that this sort of global shift towards, I guess, the right, you could say, um, is how would it affect sort of modern contemporary issues such as, um, would it be possible that this sort of ideology would become more of a scapegoat in terms of affecting modern contemporary issues such as immigration rights or um, nuclear proliferation or perhaps even foreign relations with, say, North Korea, for example, um, where these issues become more of an ideological war as opposed to actual productive developments? Or would you say that there's a possibility for the shift towards the right to serve as a new perspective to actually develop international law positively. Um, that's my question. Um, and secondly, just sorry, one question. One question. Okay, sorry. Yeah, thank you. There's some on this side. If you pose a question, then we know your mind also. That's enough. Pose a question. Good evening, sir. This is Suram from the third year. So my question is uh, directed at Justice Karma. So you had observed that uh, when an action is taken, uh, so when so an action is taken against a terrorist organization operating in one country, especially in the case of international terrorism, there's always a clash between a country's sovereignty and a country's right to self-defense. So we look at the concept of sovereignty using starts somewhere with the probably the Treaty of Westphalia, and that's not a time when one country's action can directly impact another country to this extent as it can today. So do you think this concept of sovereignty has to be kind of amended or at least left behind or at the max left behind in today's situation? Couple of more. Um, okay, yes, that, that one, two more. Yeah, last, 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 um, with regard to the International Criminal Court, they, I think we all know that there is a major crisis of legitimacy as a lot of African nations feel that they're being persecuted. So I just want to ask the panel at large what their opinion on this development is. What their opinion on? On this development the is. International Criminal Court. Yeah. Okay. Hello, sir. My first question is directed to you. Yes, how are you? So, I'm Yashasri. I'm a third year law student at Civil Law School. And uh, you stated speak the language of rule of law to answer power. So, but I have a real life situation where power seems to dominate the rule of law. And I'd like to know the, your solution to this. On 6th of August, Carla Del Ponte, Chief, Public Prosecu Chief Prosecutor, and the current head of the United Nations Inquiry Commission has resigned, stating that the United Nations Security Council lacks sure political will to convict uh, the Syrian government for its atrocities against its citizens. So when power is going beyond the rule of law, how do you think that the rule of law should take over again? And my second question sir, is to Professor Michael. 
So, uh, how do you think the non-state actors should be categorized as? Because they do not have any category as such. They are not combatants, they are not civilians. They are being given, given a hybrid status. So, what do you think they should be characterized as? So, maybe the last question should be the most there. I think we should. There is one, one more hand here. You want to speak about the last one? Yeah, my name is Savish Tagam and I that straight over here. I will no, no, speak slowly. I'm, yeah. I'm tired of the question. Just a very short question to uh, Judge Shwet. Uh, Ma'am, you ruled in the Marshall Islands case against having jurisdiction because of the absence of a legal dispute. Now, the underpinning for the legal dispute was settlement one awareness and second, a positive opposition by the responding party. Do you not think this goes against the judi judicial economy of the ICJ? Merely keeping in fact the mind that there is the applicant can again proceed in the ICJ and the proceedings can start from the very beginning. Thank you. I think we will stop there because uh, I need to give uh, there are some interesting questions and some fundamental questions. One is in the absence of uh, consent, uh, how do we approach? Right, right. That's a very fundamental question. So on that, I would like Michael to answer that first. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is that the question is wrong. The question is wrong. Consent is not the sole basis of international law. There's a vast body of customary international law, and states cannot expect accept themselves from it, it's, and they're bound by it. Treaties only bind states that, part, that are parties to them, and consent is important. The critical question about consent goes to the question of whether or not a state should be pleaded, let's say in the International Court or in the Ipos, or in an international arbitration without its consent. And a game can be played whereby a tribunal can be established and can proceed to make an award. But since enforcement ultimately depends on voluntary activity or a very expensive pursuit of the assets of a award or judgment debtor, the requirement of consent is in fact something that makes up the deficit in enforcement mechanisms in international law. So I think you should appreciate that international law in general doesn't require consent. Customer international law does not. And the consent criterion comes into play in treaties and it comes into operation in the pleading states. And I think that that should be treated with great respect in both of those two areas. And now I give the floor to Madame Shue because some questions have been raised. Yeah, and consent, I think in international law, uh, <coughs> consent, it's okay. Consent in national, there's uh, on two layers. Uh, when you talk about consent, oftentimes it concern it, 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 it may be referred to the prince of sovereignty, whether in international relations, whether states bound uh, by international Muslim states and its consent. This is the one thing. This is a general matter. Uh, there's whether there's absolute sovereignty, and uh, I think that uh, in today's world and in the international, there is no such uh, absolute sovereignty. The second matter is what uh, Professor Rizmi said, concerned consensual principle for international education. The question of sovereignty, uh, the question of the jurisdiction based on consent is a very important matter. The question of jurisdiction as uh, Professor Rosanna, a, a very distinguished scholar on the study of the International uh, Court of Justice, once said, the question of the jurisdiction is no, more, no less important than the question of the merits. The whole 
issue of jurisdiction reflects the very nature of the international legal system. That's a state system. So I won't elaborate on this, but it's a really worth studying. This is the first question. Second one, I have to address my friend Alain's question. I know the moment he mentions friendship, I, I'm expecting a fight. <laughs> our friendship is viewed on difference. That's the beauty of it. Uh, certainly, my needs are not right, but unfortunately, in international relations, rights often based on might. You have to admit it. But in terms of democracy, I don't think I agree with your definition. Democracy means one person, one vote. That's a too simplistic. We are murdering the whole theory of democracy, I'm afraid. <laughs> In international relations, when we refer to democracy, we are referring to decision making of the decision making and the decision making process. <coughs> I'll give you an example. Why, what on earth, why the head of the World Bank must be American? What on earth, why the head of uh, the, 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 the international MF has to be a European? Why this has been changed? If not because of the development of these new economies, do you think G7 countries would make a compromise? We can't be too theoristic, theor theor theoristic yeah, theoretical, too theoristic in international, for international law. We have to be realistic. And the biggest challenge, one of the biggest challenges for today international legal order is how the developed world look at rising developing world. Because I don't see any reason that West and the rest have to go have to be confrontational. It must be corporate. But this cooperation must be on mutual understanding and mutual respect. That's the very basis for future international legal order. Then to the question of a power over the rule of the law. This is something I cannot say this to my distinguished colleagues. They can give me lectures on this. But I want to say to the young colleagues, when the Security Council decides not to take certain matter, it's not the necessary power over the rule of law. And of course, you have to understand, you can easily pick up this catchy word, the rule of law, you know, very high sounding, but you have to understand the meaning, what do you mean by the rule of law? If the Security Council by its very mandate, by its very institution, decided not to take up the matter, by itself it's the rule of law if you recognize the UN system. So when you look at the matter, don't jump to simple conclusions. You have to make analysis. Um, the Marshall Islands, I think I had better not elaborate in this context, especially with my former colleagues here. I feel very much uh, intimidated, humble, and I think I Oh, I'm very understanding and not address that question here. Thank you. Thank you. I think I give the floor to uh, Judge Karamo for this. The is a way of the tremendous respect I have for his knowledge and his scholarship. But the question was should consent from Chile to be his sole basis? I think that was what I understood. Should consent continue to be his sole basis of international law. And I don't want the students to go away feeling confused. I think the question was carefully crafted, and you can see, and I don't think the students took it 
ask the question on the top of his or her head. Um, when has consent ceased to be the basis of international life? I'm not able to visualize or to imagine. Consent remains the basis of international law, including customary international law. I stand to be correct. I mean, I'm not talking about it, including. In, in customary international law, I stand implied consent. And if you object to customary international law, I think that the Americans have called what you call it persistent object. And Nyerere did it, didn't it? When he was not prepared to accept the treaty of succession, he objected until that matter was rectified. I stand to, to be corrected, but I just don't want the student to go away to say that um, now international law is so developed that you no longer need consent for that matter. Another specific and direct question that was asked was about sovereignty. You continue to hold on to your sovereignty. Without um, India's sovereignty, you will not be a sovereign nation. And, uh, but what is ne needed, in my view, is to um, pull um, the, your so to use sovereignty positively in the interest of development, in the interest of international cooperation. But you, I would advise you to give up your sovereignty. You need that. That's part of you. It's part of your DNA as a nation. So, but I mean, it should not be used negatively to say whatever I do within my state is because I'm sovereign. No, it should be used posit positively for political, social, and economic development. That's how I would see it. So, uh, I think that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, because of the advancing hour, uh, one has to be very brief, and I have to close the session. But before I close, only one or two points I make, and then request. Uh, this is Karbara because of our nationality uh, to come up uh, to uh, present a word of thanks uh, and say a few words of his own word of thanks, I suppose. So basically, most of the questions on sovereignty and consent and the role of United Nations on uh, the current uh, um, composition and the, uh, the, the development and the creation and application of international law yeah, has been widely now known is oriented on the earlier days power, balance of power, now on certain economic and power distribution in the world, and how they intermingled and rearranged themselves to create a particular moment of time, what the most highlighted the father is. So that continues, and problems which you are raising are always written, and all the, the, my colleagues have written enormously on all these matters, but I would recommend one place where you can look for it, where you can download and put on your internet. The Encyclopedia of International Law, done by Max Planck, is a place I would start on any question you have. You ask any question, of course, most of you are not going to Google it. Uh, what is uh, the, the Security Council law in this area? So that is one. Right. So no, no, that's fine. But more. The more thorough, more professional, more balanced perspective from international perspective, almost every aspect has been covered in the encyclopedia, which my confrere uh, Wolfram had edited uh, uh, along with others. So look for that encyclopedia. Ask any question you want. It's only four pages, five pages, not like a book there. And then you can get a very good load of information with citations that will help you to understand what the essence is where you want to further progress it will guide it. So I, I, I suggest that as one of the answers of most of your questions you go for it. Okay, it's not an advertisement and social media, but it's only an opportunity for you to, uh, to, to know where you can get quick answers for professional ones because of the fake news and new news and no news and online. We don't know what is the news and that kind of stuff is what's happening on the internet. So that's why I'm attending with that. So okay, next question is, we close the conference for the time being. We may not have answered all your questions. Some of your questions are really excited, including the one from my friend Alan Pele, who already kicks the ball more so high, my dad attended. So he's allowed to catch it, very good. And um, he's always an, a, 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 a source of inspiration for some of us. But I request uh, Professor Bala Ismail to give his uh, final uh, 
uh, uh, water tanks as well as the food comments. And this is an unending process. All we are trying to do is there are no answers. Please provide answers for at your generation for next generation. Thank you. First, let me thank you know, Dr. P. S. Rao, our President of IDA and the moderator of this session. I thank all the panelists, Professor Michael Eisen, Jeff Karama, and uh, uh, learned members of the IDA, my faculty members, my dear students, making this uh, session, current challenges of international law, really posed a lot many challenges which the panelists have to think again. I, once again, I thank you for participating. You all. Thank you. Thank you.